It's time for Labor Paul. And today's question has to do with truckers. A viewer asks, Labor Paul, is a truckers union a viable option? Actually, there are many truck drivers that are in the Teamsters union. So there are various freight companies that are unionized. And, you know, the amount of unionized truckers is probably in the hundreds of thousands in this country. Um, so since there are many different com companies, it's not going to be necessarily one same union for everyone. Uh, I think most of them are in the Teamsters, but you have different locals, different contracts with different companies. But the majority of truckers are not in unions and pay and working conditions for truckers has been declining for decades. So I want to take time to talk about why that has been happening. And it goes back to the deregulation of the trucking industry, which was signed into law, not by Richard Nixon, not by Ronald Reagan, but good old Jimmy Carter with the Modal Carrier, the Motor Carrier Act of 1980. I know Jimmy Carter sounds, seems like a nice dude. He builds houses and crap, but he also deregulated the trucking industry. And, you know, I'm going to still quote from Adolf Reed when he said that, um, you know, Jimmy Carter was kind of a warm up act for Reagan. And, you know, when we think about neoliberalism and the conservative reaction to organized labor, we, we usually mark uh, 1980 as a turning point, you know, with the election of Reagan, the election of Thatcher in the UK. Um, and that's definitely an important marking point. But really, if you look in the mid and the late 1970s is where you see the beginnings of this neoliberal turn really taking shape. Um, so starting in 1935, the federal government started regulating the trucking industry. So they set the price, you know, to move one good from one city to another. Uh, trucking companies had to apply for the right to carry a certain good. And this is also a way of regulating wages to keep them relatively fair. And so many more truckers were unionized throughout this period. And this system kind of came under strain with the economic crisis of the 1970s, where you had inflation, uh, what they called stagflation, the rising price of gas because of the oil shock and things like that. So, you know, in 1980, this Motor Carriers Act, which actually was introduced by Senator Ted Kennedy, um, broke up that system. So allowed anyone to haul any good to any place for any pr price that they liked. So the goal was to slash the prices of goods for consumers by forcing truckers to compete with one another on the price of transportation. And so in a way it did slash uh, prices for consumers a little bit, but at the cost of destroying the wages and working conditions of truckers. And so you have a slew of companies that emerged that were under fierce competition. And we all know what happens when profit mar margins are thin. What do they do first? They cut first from labor. Um, and that's what this competition created. And we can look at the results of this today. So in the late 1970s, the, the salaries of truck drivers were 50% higher than they are today, even when you account for inflation. Um, so right now, you know, of the 1.9 million truck drivers, their median salary is around 45,000 a year, and nearly 40% of them lack health insurance. Uh, they're also overworked. An OSHA study in 2020 um, found that truckers work a median of 60 hours per week. So the biggest winners in deregulation um, were the big retail chains um, like Walmart that had become really dominant in the shipping market. So their profits continue to climb um, and the truckers wages are stagnant at best. Um, and companies you know, are becoming more and more desperate to find anyone with a pulse that they can put behind a truck as these conditions have worsened. Um, so, yeah, I mean, more truckers should be unionized, but we also need action at the federal lo level to start regulating the industry again. And, you know, at least from what I saw, this wasn't necessarily something Bernie Sanders talked about a lot. Um, but I think it should be on the agenda for left candidates at the congressional level. You know, I think a big part of um, it's not the same thing, but Jeremy Corbyn's campaign in the UK was about re-regulating and re-nationalizing certain industries. Um, so I think that should be part of the conversation today. And, you know, at, at the heart of this, too, is this obsession. Um, I mean, this country has a doing anything to lower consumer prices. And we really have to think about, I mean, is it really worth it to maybe lower prices a little bit, but your own wage keeps lowering? I mean, how, how much longer is that going to be a benefit, especially when you think about, you know, maybe consumer products are staying cheap, but housing, healthcare, uh, you know, higher education, everything is getting more expensive. Is it really worth it doing things to keep prices low at the cost of, you know, people's jobs and their livelihoods. Um, so that's, that's all I got. You know, there are truckers in unions, but um, I think there should be more. And I think we've got to tackle the deregulation of the trucking industry. 
regulate everything. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, on the subject of uh, the kind of trade off between wages and consumer goods, I, I I don't have an answer for this, but I always wonder if there really is as big of a trade off as some people want you to think, right? Because the classic example is like, well, if you know Amazon paid their workers more, you wouldn't be able to get Prime the next day. But maybe you would, but Jeff Bezos would take a pay cut, or like maybe you would, but right. Amazon's profits would be a little lower, or maybe they wouldn't. They would have like, you know, instead of having like five hundred million types of like toothbrush or whatever that you could buy, maybe they'll have a few less or something. I don't right. know. I'm, yeah. do, do you and have any the thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because that framework, it's literally based on accepting the premise that the company has to maintain their current level right. of profit. There's just right. nothing we could ever do to stop that. Right. Except um, shave away from labor. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but again, I mean, they could easily raise wages and again, it might mean, uh, Bezos makes like how, what? 10,000 a minute instead of, um, <laughs> 20,000. 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. um, and, and also, you know, there's been a lot of, Oh, hello, Kale. Hey. Uh, yeah, Kale. <laughs> do you have about truckers? Oh, well, I was, was going to say something about Amazon and, and about, okay. uh, and prices. Like, yeah, right. I, mean, yeah. I, well, I was also going to say real quick that like they've already shown that even raising the minimum wage, for example, has not really right, raised exactly. prices. It's yeah. like maybe it's raised a Big Mac to be 10 cents more. So I think a lot of that is is false. Mm -hmm. I think Amazon is it's um, it's both a good and a bad example in some ways because it's such a massive company and because people like Bezos make so much money. Um, but it, I think it is still the case that Amazon uh, is still operating under uh, conditions of competition. They, they're, you know, they're doing speed ups. They are forcing their workers to work as hard and as long as possible, and introducing new technology to, um, you know, to increase productivity. Uh, and that's that's not arbitrary. It is still because they are in competition, especially with companies like Walmart. Um, but in other, you know, it, it kind of they have a certain sector that's really theirs, but uh, they're also competing in other kinds of markets with other capitalists. But the point that I'm trying to make really is that um, I think for a lot of this, you know, the, the, the more conservative argument of if you raise wages, you know, it's going to redound onto the consumer. Uh, that could happen. Um, and that's why you want to have across the board, across the sector uh, regulation that's put on. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not just and, you know, it's not just attacking this one company, mm -hmm. it's saying every single competitor in this market has to now deal with a new set of rules, basically. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's kind of part of the trick with any, I think, reform in capitalism is that insofar as like the motor of this whole thing is competition, you have to do something that doesn't actually end up exacerbating competition in the end by, you know, now there's just a new front runner in, in the race, you have to reduce competition across the board. So what you're saying is regulate everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> or uh, there's the, the old Jeremy Corbyn meme where like he's he's nationalizing everything and, yeah. and he points at the seagull and, and yells nationalize it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I OK, so I, I have like one sort of follow up question, I guess, for Labor Paul, uh, uh, following from the kind of truckers question, which is what is logistics? Um, we, I think we hear a lot on the left that this is like a strategic sector and I feel like truckers are included, but what are logistics and, and is this a st strategic, uh, I don't even know if sector is the right word, but a strategic right. area to be organizing? Yeah, I mean, logistics is essentially just like the method of moving shit places and people, I mean, uh, I mean, wars, for example, I mean, not to go on a real tangent here, but part of what made World War II very different was like logistics was a, a, a huge component of that war in terms of moving people and, and supplies in a whole new way. So, I mean, logistics is really just the process of getting products to a place, whether that's to a warehouse, whether it's to the store. So, yeah, truck drivers, UPS drivers, Amazon drivers. Uh, to less, maybe lesser extent, FedEx. These are all part of logis logistics, and I think also people that work in warehouses count as mm -hmm. logistics, even if they're not moving the products. What and about so, like I mean, DoorDash? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See, it's like hard. I don't. I think I, like I delivering food is a little, a little different to me. More like service um, industry. 
but yeah, it, it is yeah. very strategic. I mean, just we could all just imagine, you know, if UPS went on strike um, mm-hmm. because it's not just about like me getting my uh, cool shoes that I want, you know, or my Nevada's book, you know, <laughs> that may not bring the economy to the halt. But it's, of course, you know, um, companies that and factories that are making products that need them to be delivered. Mm-hmm. So it is strategic. And, you know, there's been this um, thing. They've been arranging it what's called just-in-time delivery systems Mm -hmm. people might know about where instead of building in time for storage you know they're they're calculating that the product is going to arrive just in time for when it's needed Mm -hmm. and you know when this started back i think in the 80s and 90s a lot of labor activists were thinking wow the companies are leaving themselves actually very vulnerable because one mess up in this chain even if one sector of workers messes it up it's going to affect the whole chain well so far i mean workers have not necessarily exercise that leverage but it it does remain that that is uh that whole process is actually very vulnerable to workers actions Mm -hmm. is there another reason why logistics is strategic other than kind of just the basic fact that if those workers stop working like everything shuts down i mean that's like nothing to sneeze at of course but um i mean i i guess i'm just asking because uh like I said, it's not really like a sector, right? Like it's very diffuse. And I'm not sure if, you know, uh, all of the people who work in this kind of amorphous thing that we're calling logistics, think of themselves as being a logistics worker. Like you probably think of yourself as like a truck driver or like an Amazon warehouse worker, right? Um, So yeah, so are there other reasons why it's a strategic area to organize? Well, I mean... I do think it is one of the, you know, but some of the other str- so-called strategic sectors, I mean, that could be debated, but mm-hmm. I mean, I, that people on the left are talking about stuff like teaching and nursing, mm-hmm. which are a little bit more white collar professionalized. So logistics is one of the few kind of blue collar sectors that are growing because we know mm-hmm. manufacturing, yeah. unfortunately, is not growing, but logis- logistics is. Um, so I think in terms of the left being rooted also in in that part of you know, the working class is also mm-hmm. important, yeah. but, but you do, yeah, you make a good point about, I mean, there's so much that could be called logistics. I mean, that's why I think, you know, focusing on certain things like, like UPS, that's like just a major hub, mm-hmm. Amazon, but at least UPS is already unionized. Right. Um, they're going to have a contract expiring mm-hmm. in 2023, which we should all watch out for. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think focusing in certain areas like that kind of makes sense. All right. Well, again, if you have any follow up questions for Labor Paul uh, related to logistics or otherwise, feel free to pop them in the chat or in the comments or hit up Paul on Twitter. And I'm we sorry for going best. after Jimmy Carter. You know, <laughs> feel bad. Yeah, but... Any defenses of Jimmy, Jimmy Carter? Uh, definitely. Right. <laughs> I don't think we'll find many of those. Yeah.